The rest of you, I'd ask you please to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hosea. Hosea is towards the end of the Old Testament. If you find it a little difficult to find, go to Daniel. One block up, you'll find Hosea. Hosea chapter 10. You could remain seating, seated. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. The Word of God. God speaking through the prophet Hosea. He said, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Father, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. We come into your presence, Lord God, completely and absolutely dependent upon your Holy Spirit, upon your presence. Lord, we've come into your house on your day to give you glory and honor and praise, to magnify your name, to exalt your name. We ask, Lord, that you would receive our praise, that you would be highly exalted, Lord God. Lord, when we stop and think that you are the ancient of days, you are the almighty, you rule, Lord, the universe from your throne in heaven. I pray, God, that you, will, that you will allow us to be mindful of your presence today, Lord, that we will sense the, the presence by your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that your word will come alive to us today. Uh, help us, Lord, to hear, to, to uh, receive. I pray, God, that you will do a work here that only you can do, Master, and that you will be glorified as a result. Lord, let your will be done today, we pray. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message is Break Up Your Fallow Ground. Break Up Your Fallow Ground. There had been a time when Israel had their confidence in Jehovah God, in God alone. They trusted in God completely. But now they were leaning on their own ways, which is our tendency. We... Uh, we as they, we need help, and so we cry out to God. Oh, God, please come and please help and please answer. And the Lord in his faithfulness shows up. And he comes and he answers and he, he picks us up and he carries us out of our trouble. He ministers to us. He strengthens us. He does everything that we asked and everything that we need. And uh, when we get ourselves back up on solid ground, we're standing on our feet again, we have a tendency to once again know everything. And so we start to lean again on our own ways until we're in trouble again and then we fall on our face and we cry out to God. And, and this, this is what Israel was doing always. In trouble they cried out to God and he came and he delivered. And, and here now is this story. Hosea comes with this prophecy. And this prophecy to Israel was, was threefold. It was meant for three, three purposes as I can see it anyway. It was first of all meant to express God's covenantal love to, to his people. That God was, was once again telling them through Hosea that I love you. If you look at the story of Hosea, it's a, it's a tearjerker. Hosea and, uh, you just read the story. God was saying to, through Hosea to the people, I have covenanted with you. I love you even through your disobedience, even through your rebellion. And, and, and even when you go your own way, I have covenanted with you. My love will never stop. It, 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 my love is strong. God tells Israel through Hosea that I'll be there for you. I love you. Another reason it was written was to warn of what happens to his people when we ignore him. When, when he is not first and foremost in our lives, uh, our lives deteriorate and God is telling us through Hosea, telling Israel through Hosea, the warnings that happen when we, when we uh, ignore him. And thirdly, it was written to give hope that no matter what we do, no matter where we've gone, there is always hope that lies ahead if we will turn back to our God. 
God likens his people to a fallow field. Fallow, we use the word fallow. You sit here you know, with me, and we don't know much about that word. We don't know much about fallow fields uh, living in the city. But if we know anything about farming at all, we would understand what the term means. Fallow fields. Uh, fields uh, need, farms, the fields need to be rotated uh, periodically. Certain crops, if they grow in the same field over and over again, certain crops draw certain nutrients from the soil. Also, certain crops tend to uh, grow certain pests, insects, that will follow a particular uh, crop. And so the field, if, it, if, it, if, if we grow the same crop in the same field, it will zap the soil of its nutrients and it will allow uh, bugs, pests, to grow in that soil. And so periodically, the, so the, the crops need to be rotated so that there will be different crops in different fields and allow the fields to replenish and allow the pests to die off. But every now and then, there's the need to allow the field to become fallow. In other words, allowed to rest. Nothing, is, it's not cultivated, nothing is seeded, it, nothing grows there. The, 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 the field needs to rest. And we see that in all of creation, God has, has built into creation rest, a period of rest. Remember on the seventh day, God rested. Now God doesn't need rest. He doesn't need anything. He neither slumbers nor sleeps, nor does he get tired at all. God didn't need to rest, but he was from the very creation showing us that rest was built into creation, that there was a time and a need for rest. We as Christians, we don't celebrate the Sabbath day, but we still find on the Lord's day a day of rest. We need to rest. God is built into creation Rest, we need it, and he has made it available to us. He's built into creation rest. He's also said that the seventh year, every field was to uh, lie dormant. It was to rest. You see the whole picture here? God's creation, his intention, was that everything would find and have a period of rest. And so the fields, the farms, the, were, uh, uh, every seven years were to rest or to become fallowed. Nothing was harvested. Nothing was planted. It was allowed to recuperate and to regain. But uh, if allowed to lie dormant, that's great. We all need rest. Not now. I, need, I, I see some of you trying to catch up on your rest right now. Don't do that. But, you know, we're supposed to be actively listening. You know what actively listening is? You could sit back and realize, no, actively listening is sitting at the edge of your seat saying, what will God say today through his word? No, there's no time to rest. But, but if we rest, and, and rest is important, but if, the, if our fields are allowed, we don't harvest them one year and they're fallow and that's good. But if, if, if a field is allowed or if it remains fallow for a longer period of time, it's detrimental. What happens then is that dark, rich soil becomes gray and it, and it crusts over. And the only thing that grows there now are weeds and thistles and thorns and no fruit. Nothing of any value grows there. Nothing but weeds or thorns. There's potential, but no fruit. Friends, there may be fields in our lives that have become fallow. Maybe, maybe we've taken a rest. We, rest is good and important, but maybe we've just, you know, we found that resting was a good thing. We, we enjoyed it so much we think we'll just stay there. And there are areas of our lives that we have rested and we've allowed to remain rested. In fact, they have become fallow. Perhaps there are areas of our lives, fields of our lives, that have never been cultivated. Parts of our lives that we have never submitted to God. We've never dug up. We've never planted seed. We've ne we're, they're just, you know, we're reserving them for future use, I suppose. But they are for our, our own personal use, and we haven't submitted them to the Lord. They've never been cultivated. They, they are fallow. Or maybe there are fields in our lives that we once cultivated. We once worked for the Lord. We once submitted to the Lord. We once used for his glory. But 
But we've allowed them now to become fallow. They, we don't use them anymore for the Lord's use. We haven't given them, we haven't submitted them to the Lord anymore. And, and those areas of our lives, those fields of our heart, if you will, have become fallowed. They've crusted over. There's no fruit. And the only thing that grows there now are weeds and thorns and thistles. They're like Death Valley. Tumbleweeds. But little else. The Lord still rains down upon our life. And the wind of his spirit still blows. And the sunshine of his glorious love still shines down upon us. But there is no fruit. Nothing grows because we haven't cultivated those areas. Some fields are not committed to the Lord. We're, we're holding back our back 40. If, you're, if, you, if you know anything about farming. We've hold, we're holding back our back 40. And God speaks through Hosea and he says to Israel then and he says to us this morning. He likens us to a fallow field. To a field that has become dormant, that has become fruitless. And the first thing he says is, break up your fallow ground. Break it up. Nothing will grow. We, we sit back and we wait for something to grow in our lives. We're, we're just waiting. How many are waiting for something to happen? Just waiting for something to grow. I, I'm waiting for, for, for some fruit in my life. I'm waiting for, for success in life. I'm waiting for a spiritual breakthrough. I'm waiting for God to move. And, and, we, and we wonder why nothing happens. Nothing's, nothing's going to happen, friends. We need to, we need, our ground needs to be broken up. We need to break up that, that hardened soil. We need to break up our fallow ground. We've gotten into a rut. Come on. Have you not gotten into a rut? I have. I'm willing to confess it and admit it today. We've gotten into a rut. In our lives, we've, got, we've gotten into a rut. Our routine, you could, you could map out your re routine for the next 10 years. It's, it's the same as it's been. The same things, we do the same things, we go through the same pattern. Nothing, very little changes, no fluctuation in our lives. The same thing happens in church. We have gotten fallow. Come on. We're predictable. It's not that we're not desirous of something happening. It's not that we're not open to a move of the Holy Spirit. But we haven't created an environment for him to move. We've come with the same expectation. And that expectation is very low. We're going we're gonna to open in prayer. We're going to read the announcements. We're going we're gonna to sing four or five songs. We're going to take up the offering. Pastor's going to come, dismiss the children's church. We're going to open up the word, read it, sit down. We're going to hear the message. We're going to pray at the end. And, 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 we, and, and our expectation is very, very low. We're, we're, in, we're in a rut. We do the same things week after week. We're, we're, we're in a rut. We need, our, our, our church has become fallow because our own individual hearts have become fallow. And all the church is is a makeup of a bunch of people. And if each individual has fallowed fields, then, then the, overall, the whole farm <laughs> is going to be fallowed. We've gotten into a rut. Matthew 13, Jesus gives a parable of the sower who goes forth sowing seed. The Bible tells us that one-fourth of the seed falls by the wayside. Nothing to, on the sidewalk, nothing's going to happen there. One-fourth falls in stony places. The ground is fallow. It's hardened. There's, it's stony. Nothing, it, it, it doesn't really take root. It tries to, but there's no real soil there to grow. And so it, it springs up and it's gone. One fourth falls uh, amongst the thorns, and when it tries to grow, it's choked out by the thorns and the thistles that are growing there. And only one fourth falls on good soil. One quarter of the seed actually makes it to root and fruit. And when that, that word good soil means organically healthy, fit, useful, serviceable, good soil, we've become spiritually fallowed. We've crusted over. 
and we need to be broken. You with me? I mean, if I'm wrong, tell me, but I, I, we've, we've become fallowed. We need to break up our fallowed ground. Uh, brokenness, it always hurts. I don't know anybody who says, I love brokenness, just crush me. I don't know anybody who says that. I know, there, in the long term, yes. It, when you understand the end result, yes. Oh God, come and break me. Lord, come and, 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 and crush me. If it means that I will be fruitful in my life, if it means that you can use me, then yes, Lord, I, break me. But it's never, uh, it's never, it's always, uh, it always hurts. There's always pain involved in brokenness. It's the hardest part of farming. You know, uh, the harvest is, is hard work. If you've ever worked the farm, harvest is hard work, but it's always joyful. You're bringing in the sheaves. You're bringing in the fruit. You're counting the dollars of the, uh, of the fruit that will be sold. You're thinking about all the people it will feed. You're, you're thinking about the sweetness of the fruit or whatever, the bread you'll bake out of it, whatever it is. It's hard work, but it's joyful because it's harvest. Seeding is hard too. Planting seed but at least it's hopeful. When you're planting the seed, you're, you're hoping that it takes root. There, there's hope involved, but, but the plowing is the hardest work, especially in days gone by when they used mules or oxen to plow, and you had to get behind that. You ever look at, see those plows? The, the heavy plow that, that it was pulled by the, by the animals. You had to hold that thing steady. You had to make sure that it stayed in the ground and it didn't jump out and bounce across the soil. It took effort to keep it down in the ground. It was always hard work and it was always difficult because there were always obstacles. You're plowing in the field, you're going to run into rocks, boulders that are a hindrance. They sometimes break the, the, the plow and you have to start again. But, the, but there's hindrances in the soil, rocks that have been there for years and now you, you hit them while you're plowing hindrances and obstacles in the way, they're always there. And there are always roots from things that once grew there. You're plowing the field so that you can, you can properly cultivate it and properly seed it so that it will be fruitful. And while you're plowing, you run into the roots, the old root system of things that once grew there. You see, friends, when we come to Christ, He saves us. And we're so excited about being saved and, 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 we, and we deal with the, the surface. But oftentimes there are, still, there are still roots of things that we once planted, roots of things that once grew there. Are you with me? And the soil will resist the, 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 uh, the plow from moving. We've dealt with the surface, but, but there are still roots now that we have to deal with. And, and that's the hard part. Our hardened hearts need to be broken. They need to be, be exposed. Any pride or bitterness or resentment or self-centeredness. Roots of self that are there. Roots that we once, we once grew. We once even fertilized. Now, they're, now we've dealt with the old crop, but the roots are still there. And we still have to deal with those things. Our hardened hearts need to be broken. It's time to seek the Lord. Hosea said it's time to seek the Lord un until he rains down righteousness. Well, there's sowing of the seed as well. We will reap what we sow. It's a universal law. Listen, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 9, Paul says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever... A person, it's written in the masculine, but let's, whatever a person soweth, that shall they also reap. For they that soweth to their flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But they that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There is a universal law of sowing and reaping. You can't change it. It's, it's, it's God's law. You can't change God's law. You, I mean, you can, 
You can uh, you plant cotton seeds. What's going to grow? If if anything grows at all, it will be cotton. You plant tomatoes. What are you going to? What's going to grow? If anything grows at all, what will grow? It's going to be tomatoes. That's a law. You can't change it. You can't plant one thing and expect to harvest something else. You are going to harvest the seeds, or the fruit of the seeds that you plant. And no matter what, you cannot change it. This is God's law. We, when we plant water and wait, what is our reward? Not something different, but the fruit of what we have planted. Not something different. Exactly what we planted, only now enriched and fruitful. Are you still with me? If you look down, I think I lost you. Unless I see you taking notes. I think it was Ben Franklin, then Zig Ziglar, now everybody, who says uh, the, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I'm trying to get potatoes to grow, but I, I don't understand it. I keep planting corn, and I get these potatoes. I don't, every year, the same thing. That's pretty insane, isn't it? I'm not going to get my, my potatoes until I plant potato seeds. Are there potato seeds? I've never seen one. Whatever it is, you, you're not going to grow. You're, nothing's going to change. Insa it's insane to think that you're, you're going to grow something other than what you're planting, what you're sowing. It, Dan Betzer uh, you, he said it this way, to get what you've never gotten, you must do what you've never done. You want, you want some fruit, then you've got to change. If, if there's no fruit growing in all that you do, then, then there never will be. It would be insane to think that something's going to change unless you change it. To get what you've never gotten, you must do what you've never done. If there's a hope for fruit, there must first be cultivation. You've got to cultivate. You've got to break up the soil, and you've got to sow the seed. You can't change this law. You can't change, you can't change God's law. The law of sowing and reaping is as definite as the law of gravity. You could climb up on this roof and you could defy gravity. And you can say, I'm going to jump off and I don't believe in gravity. I'm going to challenge gravity. I think, I'm, I think I know better than gravity. And the only thing you're going to prove is that gravity does in fact exist and that it is irresistible to your uh, attempts. And all you, you, you can argue this all you want, but the fact remains, whatever you sow, you're definitely, without a doubt, of that seed going to reap in your life. It's, it's, it's a law of God. And the fact is, we're always sowing something. There's never a time when we cease sowing seed. Listen, we're now reaping what we once sowed. Child of God or not. We are reaping what we once sowed. You know, if we sowed good seed in our past, we are reaping of that seed. We're reaping blessings today. If we sowed of bad seed, then we've got issues that we're dealing with. They don't go away simply because we've come to Christ. Oh, now we have his strength. Now we have his grace to deal with them. But if, you know what I'm talking about. If you've if, if you've made bad deals or gotten into bad relationships or made bad decisions, uh, they don't go away simply because we come to Christ. We're, we're, we're still reaping what we've sown. Only now we have the grace of God to help us through, and uh, he may heal and he may deliver, but um, you, you follow me? We're reaping what we once sowed. But here's the most important thing. That, that's important, but get this. We will one day reap what we are sowing now. See, that's important to realize. Because whatever you have done up until this point, tomorrow's another day. We could, we could change. We could, we could change the harvest. You know, all I get is bad stuff. Well, you could change it if you start planting good seed. I can't, we can't do anything about what happened yesterday, but we can certainly change what goes forward from here. And so we are now absolutely going to reap what we are sowing today. Look at what you've done this past week. All of us. Look at what we've done. 
Do, do we want that growing in our lives? Just stop and think. What I have invested in this week, where I have put my efforts, the, my energies, my, my time, where I placed my emotions, what I've invested my heart in, where my flesh has gone, where my mind has been, where my money and my time have gone. If, if those are seeds that we have planted, do we really want the fruit of those things growing in our lives? Stop and ask yourself, do I really want to reap the things that I've sown this week? Was it seed sown to the flesh, to the pleasure and gratification of the flesh? Then the Bible tells us that of the flesh we shall reap corruption. Good fruit never follows things of the flesh. You there? Good fruit never follows. If it's, if it's, if it's of, of, of the Spirit and to the Spirit, then we will reap of the Spirit eternal life. If you plant it, it will grow. Regardless of what it is, if you plant it, it will grow. What is it that you would like to reap? What is it that you would like to see in your life? What is the fruit, what is the harvest that you, would, that you want to see, that you want to have in your life? Then you have to plant seeds, appropriate seeds for that fruit. You have to plan the harvest. Right? What do I want to see in my life? Then you have to plant the appropriate seeds. You have to first break up the fallow ground and then plant the appropriate seed that that which you desire would grow. The seed. Friends, I'll, there, there, the seed can be many different things. Prayer for our spiritual well-being. You've broken up the fallow ground. You're now planting seeds. Seeds of repentance. Seeds of desire for God. You're seeking God. Then what are you going to reap? You're going to reap the presence of God. You're going to reap the power of God, a relationship with Him. You're going to reap of the Spirit because you've sown seeds of the Spirit. You're sowing seeds of prayer for others. You're investing your time, your heart in, the, in prayer for people, for others. What are you going to reap? You're going to, first of all, reap the benefits, the blessings in the lives of those you pray for. God's going to answer prayer. But somebody's going to pray for you. See, it's a law of sowing and reaping. What you sow, you will reap. And if you sow seeds of prayers for others, I just believe that God is going to allow others to pray for you. You're going to reap the blessings of somebody else's prayer. Listen, you give to those that are in need. You're sowing seed. You're, what are you going to reap? You're going to reap the blessings that they're going to be blessed. Somebody's going to be blessed as a result of you sowing seed into their lives. Just what you desire, you're going to see. Uh, and Jesus said, we're storing up treasure in heaven when we give to those in need. And I believe that we reap what we sow. And so when we fall on hard times, I just believe that we're going to be able to draw from that account. Somebody's going to help us. You follow me? I, I believe this with all my heart. It's a law of God that's not alterable. The greatest seed is sowing the gospel. We will, what will, when we sow the gospel into the hearts and lives of others, what will we reap? First of all, we will reap a harvest of souls. See, when we tell somebody about Jesus Christ and they receive that message, just like you did, they'll be saved when they acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior. You'll reap what you sow. People will get saved because you cared enough to share the gospel with them. But I also believe this. You've heard me say it before. You reap what you sow. You're sowing seed into somebody's loved one. you got some loved ones that are not saved. I believe you'll reap what you've sown. Somebody will sow seed into your loved one. Somebody will water the seed that you've already planted. God is going to reward us according to what we do. Not with salvation. We're not earning our salvation. You understand what I'm saying. But we will reap what we have sown. The sower in tears. Psalm 126, 5. The Bible says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. See, the sower doesn't see the golden harvest. All they see is the, the fallowed soil. All they see is the ground ahead of them, dry and barren and lifeless. All they see is the plow. All they see is the work ahead of them. They don't, they don't see the golden fields. They don't see the fruit. It's not there. They don't see that. They don't, they don't hear the singing of the harvest, the people who are coming forth with, with, the, with, with, the, with the singing and the laughter of the harvest time. They don't, they don't hear that. They don't see the dancing of the celebration of the harvest. They don't see that. All they see is the work ahead of them. And, and they, have, they don't have the harvest before them. He sows in tears, hoping and praying that something will happen. Charles Greenaway, I know I've told you the story, but some of you haven't heard it. Charles Greenaway, a mission, great missionary to Africa, all over the world, you know, a former professor of mine, and one of my mentors, I have to say. Charles Greenaway tells a story of Africa and how they went into Africa, into a village in Africa where the people were hungry. There had been famine, there had been a, a, a poor harvest, and the people ha had no food. And the Assemblies of God sent in a truckload of, of seed, of, of grain to be eaten. Bags of grain that they, that they were going to cut open and feed the people. And so when the, the, the truck pulls in and, and it's full of grain, it's full of seed, and, and, uh, and instead of dancing and singing, and, you know, the village elders got together and they began to talk. And they were weeping and they were praying. Greenway went over to him and said, what are you doing? Come on, man, open up the bags, feed the people. They said, well, Greenway, here's our dilemma. We can do that. We could open up the bags and we could cook the grain and, and the village will have food for a day or two. We could do that. And we we're so thankful for the grain. He said, but our, our dilemma is if we plant it, if we plant it, we won't have just a meal for a day or two if we plant it and it grows, we'll have a harvest and we'll have, we'll have food enough for the whole season. So here's our dilemma. And so rather than just open up the bags, they wept over the seed and they planted it instead. God, we're submitting this. We're, we're committing this seed to the soil and, we're, and we're, we need a harvest. And they wept over it, knowing that if it didn't take root and it didn't grow, everything was lost. Not only did they not eat, but they had no harvest. And they wept over the seed. Friends, the, the Bible says that we must weep. We weep over the seed. And if you look at the context of Hosea, the sowing was, was in seeking the Lord, breaking up the fallow ground and planting the seed. It is, it is, it is seeking the Lord. That's what it means to break up your fallow ground and to plant seed. It's, it's seeking God. And the joy... But thirdly, reap with joy. Psalm 126.5 says, Say, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Galatians chapter 6, if we faint not, the plowing, the sowing, the watering, it's all draining, it's all hard work. This isn't easy. This is, Christianity is not for the faint of heart. It, digging plowing up old fields, planting seed, watering it, harvesting. This requires effort on our part. But it says, do not be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary in the midst of it. Listen, we must endure to the end. Don't allow ourselves to become fallow. Don't allow the fields of our lives to harden over. And if so, don't allow them to remain there. If there's areas of our hearts and lives that we've allowed to grow, to grow dormant, don't allow them to stay there. They're unfruitful. We have, to, we have to dig them up. We have to dig up, break up the fallow ground. Listen, we must be plowing, sowing, and reaping until Jesus comes. I, I, pray, I heard about a pastor uh, um, the other day. He died while preaching. It's, honestly, in, I, friends, we should die if, if, the, if we don't get raptured, if we don't go up when the trump of God sounds. We, I, I want to die in harness. You know what I mean? I, 
If I got to die, I would, you know, when I'm making my point or I'm giving the altar call, Lord, just take me home then. Let it be when the word of God is going forth, when the seed is being sown, when the soil is being plowed, when you're witnessing, you're telling somebody you're, you know, about Jesus Christ. If you got to die, hey, guess what? If we don't go into Trump, we're all going. We're all going to die. Let us die in harness. Let us die, die plowing the field, planting the, the, the seed, you know, leading somebody in the sinner's prayer. But we can't give up. We endure to the end. We're plowing, our, we're watering, we're seeding we're, until the Lord takes us home. I'm almost done. If our joy is thin, because it says if we, if we sow with tears, we will reap with joy. Doubtlessly. And so if our joy is thin, you say, I don't know what you're ranting and raving about up there, Pastor. I don't, I don't get this. I don't have joy. My joy is thin. If your joy is thin, perhaps your seed is no good. Maybe it's the wrong seed. You're expecting potatoes and you're planting... Comquats. <laughs> That's just a funny word. I don't know. I don't know what they are. But maybe you're sowing the wrong seed. Maybe, maybe what you're planting, maybe what you're investing is, is of the flesh and not of the spirit. You're not going to reap joy of the flesh. You're only going to reap joy of the spirit. Joy comes from the, from the presence of God, from, from the, the Holy Spirit. So if you're joyous, then maybe the seed that you're sowing is no good. Maybe you're, you're sowing seed for instant gratification, but there's no lasting joy. Perhaps our seed is, 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 uh, is too thin, not planting enough, too sparse or too infrequent with the, with the seed that we, that we sow. Maybe there's not enough tears. Maybe we're not weeping over over the seed that we put. Listen, he that goeth forth and weepeth. How, how concerned are you about the seed you're planting? Is it important enough to weep over? Is it important enough, especially if you're investing in, in the lives or eternal lives of others, is it important enough? How concerned are you about the well-being of others? How concerned are you about the souls of others? Enough to weep over them? Enough to plant the seed in weeping. Psalm 126, 6, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest, and we must go forth, and we need to plow, and we need to sow, and we need to water. There is fallow ground in our church. You, you could argue with me. I, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I know there's fallow ground in our church. There are fields that haven't been harvested. There are hearts. And, and as I said on the onset, that, that the church is made up of individuals. There, there's fallow ground in our church because there's fallow ground in the individual hearts, mine own included. And so we, we can't expect to see fruitfulness until we break it up. Until we break up the fallow ground, until we plant proper seed, until we, we got to cultivate. We have to create that environment for fruitfulness to come. Amen. I know if Brother Lou was here, he'd be shouting. <laughs> Listen, this fallow ground, it cannot be business as usual. We're talking about shutting down ministries because we don't have people. There's a hundred folks here. What do you mean we don't have people? What do you mean we don't have people who will step up and, and, and take care of the children? You want to talk about seed. If, if our children are not precious seed that will grow a harvest for years to come, if we don't care enough about our kids, how could we expect there to be any future for our church? We are not gaining ground but losing it. I'm just, hey, I'm sorry. I have to tell you the facts. So we've got this ground that needs to be broken up. 
cultivated, seeded, wept over, prayed over. And God will bring in the increase if we faint not. If we faint not. Almost done. Springtime is the only time for sowing. There's a season for everything. If, if, if we lose seed time, all is lost. You can't plant in the middle of the summer and expect there to be a harvest. You certainly can't plant in the fall and expect there to be a harvest this year. You can't, you can't plant in the winter. Springtime, there's a season for planting. Let's say if we miss the, the opportunity, if we miss the seed time, we've missed the harvest. Harvest depends entirely upon how one feels about sowing. If sowing is important, if sowing good seed is important, then we'll, we'll, we'll be busy doing it. If sowing good seed is not important, then don't expect, don't expect good, report, good rewards. We could sit here and hope for something until the cows come home. But nothing, there will be no fruit unless we take sowing seriously. Harvest depends entirely upon how one feels about sowing. If we believe it's important, then we, need, we may need to break up our fallow ground. We may just need to do that. To use the vernacular in my conclusion, what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. Into what are you investing your life? What did you invest in this week? What have you been investing in? Your emotions, your time, your talents. You, where are you investing? If it's to the flesh or in the flesh, you may, you may have gained instant gratification. You might be able to tell us about all the fun you had this week. But nothing follows. There'll be no eternal fruit. There'll certainly be. It, you know, Paul says that if we sow to the flesh, it, it, it's, it's wood, hay, and stubble. All those things burn in the fire. And, and when we stand before God, there's no reward. Because it was just, it was seed sown to the flesh and not to the spirit. No lasting joy. But if we have sown seed into your spiritual life, into, into, into the things of the Spirit of God, if we've invested in the things of God, then of the Spirit we will reap. We'll reap spiritual things. The, the power, the presence, the hope, the joy of the Spirit of God and life eternal. Search me, O God, and, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Are you willing to pray that today? God, search my heart and see. Is there fallow ground in me? Listen, as, if, throughout history, you'll find this to be true. Any individual who ever experienced fruitfulness, anybody, Bible, ancient history, recent history, even someone now that you may know of, anyone throughout history who has experienced fruitfulness, spiritual fruitfulness, are those who have committed themselves to God. Those who have exposed the, the fallowed ground, said, Lord, plow, break me, cut, cut me, change me. If there's, any, if there's any areas of my life that I have not committed to you, if there's any areas of my life that I've held back, if there's any hardness of my heart, then Lord, please, I, I expose it to you that you, would, that you would help me to plow this field. I give it to you. There's painfulness involved. There is. There's commitment involved. Those who have been broken will know fruitfulness. Any church that has revival, any church that is seeing people being saved, people being healed, delivered, any church where the Spirit of God is moving and, pe and, and, and there's life is a church that is made up of broken individuals. Amen. Individuals who have surrendered themselves to the Lord. Amen. And God is moving in those lives. And so that field is, is no longer fallowed but fruitful. God will take those those fallowed fields, and when we've broken them and we've cultivated them, and he'll allow fruitfulness. He'll allow fruitfulness in this church, in your lives, in your home. He'll allow fruitfulness. But only if you're willing to break up that fallow ground and allow God to move in your life. I don't know, church. I, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know what more to say. 
we've got to, we've got to break up the fallow ground. We've got to cultivate our lives before the Lord. We've got to. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we stand before you, we sit before you, Lord. Father, we ask that your spirit would move, God, that this word to Hosea, through Hosea to Israel, and now, Lord, th th to this church this morning, Father, that it would find its place, that it will be in itself a seed that takes root and grows. I pray, God, that those who have heard me have heard me. I pray, God, that those that have listened this morning have truly heard this message, that they understand, Father, what, what you're saying to us today. There's fallowed ground. There is hardened fields of our lives and of our heart that we have either never given to you or we have since uh, taken back and allowed to grow hard and dormant and there's no fruit and we sit here asking and wondering why we can't see your spirit move because we have not broken our ground. We have not surrendered to you. I pray, Father, that you'll move in this place today, that this word would find its place and that your will will be done. Our heads are bowed in his presence. We're, I pray that you're at this moment opening up your heart to him. I pray at this moment you're, you're asking the searchlight of the Holy Spirit. God, is it me? Where in my life, Father, is there, are there fields that I have not surrendered to you? Where, Lord, are there areas of my heart that I have allowed to grow cold? No longer, Lord, are they fruitful. I've lost ground rather than gained in my spiritual walk. Would you take inventory this morning? Would you ask yourself? Would you ask the Holy Spirit to show you? Is there an area today that you're willing to surrender to Him? Part of your life that you say, God, I give this to you. Forgive me, Lord, for holding back. But I understand, Lord. Maybe, maybe you just needed to hear it put this way. But you realize that there are parts of your life that are they're just not what they used to be. The fruit of the Spirit of God is not, it's not there. The joy of the Lord. The, the joy of His presence. The power of your witness. It's just not there. Holy Spirit is showing you, and He will. He will. For some of you, this is a confirmation of what God has already shown you. You already know. You know. For whatever reason, you've fought it, or you've tried to argue it away, or you're waiting. God, by His Spirit, is just confirming what you know. You need to break that, that up. I, we're going to open the altar. We're going to have some time here this morning. I don't want to just dismiss this service without an opportunity. I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not going to beg you. 